all of us, I would say, initially entered the anti-war movement from a sense that what was being done in Vietnam was a nightmare and that we couldn't tolerate it and that we had to do whatever we needed to do to make it stop. Now, first we thought we could address the American people and that as a whole we would make it stop. And then we learned that not everybody agreed with us and that many people really wanted to believe that what the government did was right. And there was a growing sense of pain and of death and of our responsibility for that pain and that death because we were aware of it and because we cared about it and because we focused on it. My initiation to civil disobedience was with a group I joined in 1967 called the Committee for Nonviolent Action. And we had to do something about the war. And we were, our conception of the war was that it was immoral. And so where do you go to rally support to oppose an immoral policy but the churches? And so what we started doing, and we believed that the churches were failing in their obligation, the churches, the synagogue, the religious institutions of America were failing in their obligations to take a stance against the war. So we decided to confront the churches. And we got dressed up in our best clothes every Sunday. Um, our leader, I hesitate to call her that, but the person around who gave us a lot of inspiration was a woman who was active in the civil rights movement, very active, a white woman who had four sons and who actually disrupted a, um, a speech by Robert Kennedy on the University of um, Wisconsin campus once. And uh, with her, a group of about eight of us, she was older than us, went to churches every Sunday in our best clothes, but we had signs with us in our pocketbooks and, and, and hidden under our clothes. We would, like, we would like put our jackets in such a way that these signs couldn't be seen and very carefully maneuver ourselves into little seats. And at a certain point, we would stand up in the aisles and take out our signs, Thou shalt not kill, and the war in Vietnam, love thy neighbor, and we would stand there silently and we had quite a mixture of, of reactions. I'm not going to tell you what denomination bodily threw us out of the church, <laughs> but that did happen. I will say that the Unitarians were del delighted, could not have been more delighted, and stopped everything and thanked us for coming and invited us to sit down and chat. And they would just get the service over with as quickly as possible so they could talk to us interesting, committed people. So we ran the gamut. That's not exactly civil disobedience. It's a little bit of quite civil disruption. Um, and then Dow Chemical Company, <clears throat> as it had been doing for years, but now in this new age of the anti-war consciousness, in this new era of life, Dow Chemical came to the University of Wisconsin and began interviewing people. I didn't even know that the group was planning to block the interviews. I was in, I was out. I had just gotten out of class, and I, somebody told me something was going on over at engineering. I said, oh, let's go see. <laughs> so we trotted over, me and this, this guy, from my class, and my God, these were all the people I had done disruption with all summer and all autumn of the previous year. It was now February of 1967, and they were in a police van or bus, and the police were trying to take them to jail. And there were my friends and my colleagues on the ground in the snow attached to the bumper of this police car. And it really didn't take me two seconds because the first breakthrough I had was getting on a picket line. I, I don't even remember what was being picketed. I mean, it was something good. It was, it was something that deserved to be picketed. I can absolutely tell you that. But having done that, it didn't really take long for me to cross the line again from a bystander to a participant, and I latched onto the bumper of that bus, and I stayed there for a couple of hours until I was bodily carried off to jail with all my friends where we all sang civil rights songs. 
We weren't going to let anybody turn us around until the chancellor bailed us out to just keep things quiet. And we were terribly proud of ourselves. And then I think, you know, that was it. We had, by this time, a very acute sense that the Vietnamese were running through our fingers like sand, that we couldn't close our hands to stop that loss of life, to stop that loss of blood, and that every second that went by, more lives were being lost. And more and more, we felt that the American people were responsible, that the young men that were drafted into the Army were the arm of enforcement for this kind of really quite industrial genocide that was being carried out on a foreign people. And so we were no longer willing, the willingness to sit and coax people into being nice, into being good, and into being moral eroded. And our horror for the situation and our contempt for the American people who were allowing it to go on became quite enormous. And finally, a strategy was developed, an ideology was developed to really quite forsake any attempts at persuasion. Now, of course, this had a lot to do with how we saw the American people. There were many people, many religious leaders, many labor leaders who saw the American people quite differently and who saw them as being very much victimized by the war and very much victimized by having their young men under the pressure of, of, of having to be expatriates or jailed or being called cowards going against their entire culture um, had a lot of sympathy for the young men who went over to enforce this policy. We didn't feel that. <laughs> our perception was different, and our perception led us to a confrontational politics. And that developed into a logic that actually made, makes quite a bit of sense, and it's not the first time that it's been used. I believe there were quite a number of French in France during the Algerian War who went so far as, as to uh, blow up ca people in cafes, uh, people in movies, as a statement against the Algerian War. Um, and to cause so much disruption that the war couldn't be pursued and that a settlement would have to be arrived at. Well, I participated in a number of demonstrations. They weren't really demonstrations anymore. They were confrontations. One of them was when a group of, of us, who we now called ourselves weathermen, and who had adopted the policy of, at this point, propagandistically and symbolically becoming Vietnamese within America. We went to the south side of Milwaukee, which is um, a white working class neighborhood and where Father Grappi had had civil rights marches. And we carried a National Liberation Front flag into a Mark's Big Boy drive-in hamburger parlor. And I remember, and it was very much the approach of a gang going for a rumble. And I remember the people there separating the men and women in our group out very quickly. And I remember being ringed by a group of girls who looked me in the eyes with tears in their eyes and said, my brother's in Vietnam. Do you want him to die? Is that what this means? Is that, is that what this is about? What was I there for? I had a lot of issues about personal courage. Um, I still thought that perhaps if I had physically fought back with the men who raped me that I could have gotten away. I was very much steeped in the group and I, I was genuinely outraged by the war. I, but I, I was there to kind of prove my own guts, I'd say, on, on the whole. And so I couldn't answer a question like that. And I couldn't answer her. And I remember kind of being like snatched up by this group of girls and like flung from one to the other, almost in a kind of disgust rather than a, in a real hostility. For the men in the group, they were like thrown down and kicked. Um, 
which is the way to end a rumble. And then they let us get up and leave. I hadn't thought about the cops at all. I had no reason to think about the cops. I hadn't dealt with the cops. The first time that they intruded onto my consciousness was the second demonstration against Dow Chemical Company, which was in October of 1967, when thousands of people decided to block the Dow Chemical recruiters. Thousands decided to demonstrate, not to go inside and block the doors. Hundreds did. I was one of those hundreds. Of course, it was now my turf. I had been one, one of the people who led the way. And the cops came in full riot gear, like huge mechanical toys. You know the toys you see now that, that like unfold into airplanes? You know, they're so mechanical. They have these big hoods. They have these huge shoulders. That's what they were like. They were in full regalia. And they had nightsticks. And they just started at one end of the Commerce Building Hall and worked their way through to the other end, clubbing people who were sitting on the ground and clubbing them quite enthusiastically. There was hatred. Why they hated us, I don't know. I didn't think about why. They weren't human to me. They were behind their armor. I saw one woman kicked in the stomach. <laughs> and we were so brazen that we took her into one of the side rooms and, and laid her on a table and helped her. And when, a, when some of the police came into the room with their clubs still ready, we screamed at them, look what you've done. Are you proud of your beautiful work? Quite brazenly. We were too full of adrenaline, probably, to be afraid, and we were too outraged. And even after what had just happened, we really believed that they weren't, that having seen this horrible thing that they did, that they wouldn't do it anymore. And in fact, the cops left us alone in that room. Um, but once they got everyone outside, there was a full-scale riot going on. Tear gas, I mean, they were, had tried to arrest people. No one was going to let them take anyone away. Tear gas began flying all over the place. I saw something that I couldn't even understand until months, maybe it was years later, I saw a car barreling down the drive and someone jumped on it. A young man jumped on the hood of the car and smashed in the windshield with his boot. And it took me a long time to understand why that happened. Like, why is he jumping on the car? Why is he hurting the car? You, you become infantile sometimes in such a situation. Well, of course, what was happening was that man was trying to run somebody over. That man was so carried away by the heat <laughs> and the frenzy of that situation that everything that was pent up inside him it totally crossed the line. I, I can't believe he was saying at the moment. He tried to run somebody over and someone put a stop to him real quick. That was what I thought of the cops. They were enemies. They weren't human. It's taken me a long time <laughs> to overcome not only my prejudice toward the, towards the police, but toward anyone doing anything. I would like to say now at this point of my life that I stand in judgment and condemnation of no one. I don't care if they're the person with their finger on the atomic bomb or a person beating up somebody helpless or a mass murderer. That, that judgment and condemnation are, are like the most useless of attitudes to take towards any situation and that something else is called for. Understanding, certainly. And um, some kind of plan for limiting how much harm people can do, but people are people. And their motivations are something I can identify with. And I learned as I became more and more of an activist how much in common I had with people I had condemned, so that at this point I stand in judgment as much as I can of, of no one.